As marketers are dealing with the fallout from privacy regulations and technology changes, notably iOS 14.5 and on, one of the big challenges has been how to measure what we do. The shiny veneer of multi-touch attribution has worn off, to say the least, and marketers are starting to come to terms with two things. Number one, there is no single source of truth or silver bullet tool to tell them deterministically how their media dollars performed. And number two, there are several tools in the measurement toolbox they need to need to learn about and start using. To help us explore these challenges and hopefully give us a map for navigating this labyrinth of measurement decisions, I am uh, honored and humbled to be joined today by uh, Ben Dutter, Senior Vice President of Strategy at Power Digital. He has more than a decade of media experience, has planned and managed billions of ad spend for clients like LinkedIn, MailChimp, Amazon, Facebook, Skechers, and more. And the cherry on top, he's also a tabletop game designer with titles like Belly of the Beast and Perseverant, a story game of desperate survival. Welcome to the Measure Up podcast, Ben. Thanks, Jim. Happy to be here. And uh, I love the the diligence you did. My tabletop <laughs> stuff doesn't get brought up uh, very much on these, but appreciate that. Of course, I gotta bring that up. Um, and, and speaking of uh, desperate survival, um, we're going to be talking about how marketers can measure their efforts. Uh, so before we dive into that, Ben, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are and uh, about the work that you're doing at Power Digital? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I started right out of college, I actually was poached working at uh, as a sales guy at Best Buy um, by a mom and pop shop that needed help with selling these very expensive commercial trucks, these custom commercial trucks. And they just said, hey, we need someone to help us with our digital marketing. And uh, so I learned that the hard way, just jumped right in and started tracking into search and, and early days of social media back then. And uh, yeah, just kind of stumbled my way through it, ended up working for a subsidiary of Walgreens for a time and managed a, a pretty large, a, a 9,000 SKU store brand side for a while. That got boring to me, no offense, Walgreens, and uh, eventually <laughs> went agency side and, and have been at a couple of great agencies ever since. And currently, like you said, at Power Digital. What we do at Power and what I oversee is our strategy division, um, which is mostly around planning and media, as well as measurement and data intelligence. So I'm very privileged to have a team of about 45 very smart people, smarter than I am, uh, who report into me, who help make our clients money. Awesome. Um, so the the main topic that we're going to be diving into, um, actually, before we do that, I, I have to ask about the the commercial trucks. Did you did you sell a lot of those commercial trucks? Or well, you only need to sell a couple uh, when you have a, <laughs> a ten person company to do pretty well. But I did sell a couple. Um, nice. And but it was it was a very interesting business. Uh, Todd Ford, wherever you are out there, appreciate the opportunity to uh, learn on the job. Yeah, those those first starts are always uh, interesting because you know, especially at the smaller companies, and and you know, you're you're kind of just learning on the job, and you know, trial by fire, and <laughs> lots of lots of good stories usually come out of those uh, those first jobs. So. Exactly. But uh, yeah, so the thing that um, I really want to have a conversation with you about uh, is something that I've been really kind of thinking hard about and struggling with the last six, nine months, maybe past year is around multi-touch attribution and around how that fits within sort of the, the fuller measurement uh, landscape for marketing, which is, you know, everyone's heard about marketing mix modeling that's starting to become, you know, more popular again as data goes away. Um, randomized controlled trials or test and learn uh, experimentation um, you know, we have all of these new methods that, um, not, not new, but, you know, new to us, new to marketers, uh, in some, some instances, uh, that are kind of starting to become more important. Um, and, you know, people are struggling with, well, you know, I have MMM or I have tests or I have MTA, which one do I use? How do I use them together? And so I've been seeing a lot of talk about triangulation, right? The idea that you're, you you have your marketing mix model and you have your testing and you have your multi-touch attribution and somewhere in between those three lies the truth. So let's, I, I know you talked recently about, uh, about this topic at, uh, the rocker box summer camp, uh, virtual conference. So what, what are your thoughts here? Just kind of generally opening this up. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's a it's a natural byproduct that's happened. A lot of sharp marketers and measurement folks have been doing this sort of accidentally or organically or intuitively for the past decade. I think there's a whole generation of marketers and I'm I'm included in this where they started in performance marketing, and digital marketing and the ability the promise of of that was the ability to track at a user level or an engagement level I saw this ad, I clicked this ad, I made this purchase, and I can follow that funnel all the way through. And even back then, when it was allegedly working as intended prior to uh, the recent sort of last couple of years of data deprecation evolution, I actually don't think it was working any better than it was working today. I think that people just sort of fooled themselves into thinking it was working. And so the, all of the most successful marketers in my career and brands that I've been privileged to work with who look at growth had been doing this sort of anyway. You know, they've been looking at, well, this says this, but my P&L says that. Let's bring in a third thing to break the tie and figure out which is which. And then you use those experiments or those other signals to calibrate whatever your kind of working view or your working dashboard is. And that allows buyers and planners and strategists to make the daily or weekly decisions that they have to make while still kind of marching in the right direction for the overall business. Yeah. I I wonder, I I know you mentioned this too, like you kind of grew up in this like performance marketing space. I I was similar. Um, I was more on the, the organic side on SEO before I got into, to analytics. Um, But, you know, I, I think, I, I wonder how much, how many marketers are like me or like you, where we have this sort of view coming from that, uh, that that you know, the past ten years of using multi-touch attribution, where that was just sort of the the given, right? Like that's just what people use. Versus, you know, how many marketers out there come from the brand side and they're like, well, of course that MTA stuff was always garbage, and we knew that all along. Like, it's in, I, I don't know. And I, I obviously, you know, we're kind of in a a bubble, so it's kind of hard to see outside. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, do, you, do you think that um, a lot of marketers are out there saying, like, finally, that MTA nonsense is over? <laughs> I do, yeah. And I, I've had those conversations, interestingly enough, where, you know, I was lucky to work brand side, uh, like I said, at a subsidiary of Walgreens, and the, the COO there was extremely sharp on the financials and on understanding kind of the ebb and flow of organic or inherent baseline demand of a business. You know, there's just sort of a natural momentum or inertia of a business and and marketing is really just a kind of an amplifying effect on that, right? It can it can accelerate it to some extent. Um, so I learned from a, a pretty early on in my career, probably, you know, the first couple of years where it was always a bit of that art and science of we know there's a halo effect. Some of these things we can't track. We also know that there's some certain things that we're over tracking and that is kind of over crediting, right? And I think the classic example of this that a lot of people are like, well, yeah, that makes sense is television. You know, television up until the alleged promise of CTV tracking, there really is no way to deterministically track if somebody saw a TV ad. I mean, there's ACR and stuff out there, but there's it's very difficult for people to no, hey, I saw this commercial and then I went to Target and, and bought your toilet paper or whatever. So it's very bigger businesses, I think, have always operated in this kind of like what I call low saturation uh, or low information model where they're able to not really see in really granular high resolution detail. Um, they just know like when we spend X amount, we get Y return and they validated that through decades sometimes of testing, right? And so I think that brand people, quote unquote, and like CFOs and COOs have understood that, especially from the CPG space. But the more e-commerce, D2C, growth hacky, where it's like, there is no such thing as brand, there's only sales like that. You know, those, <laughs> those are two sort of interesting universes that have kind of collided, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Startups that are kind of digital first and, and uh, digital native and direct to consumer e-commerce that are just relying on data collection and analysis. And it's, it's easy to see how they kind of, um, fell into this trap of, um, believing, you know, 
multi-touch attribution. And I, I count myself into that, you know, in the past, over the past decade, you know, I, I was bought in to the whole narrative coming from the Google Analytics and the other tools that were like, oh, we can track this user all over the web and we can do this, you know, uh, data-driven attribution even, you know, after the, you know, multi-channel attribution where you're just deciding linear or time decay and then, oh, now we're doing data-driven attribution. So it's even better. It's like, well, you know, like a lot of people, again, myself included for a certain bit of time is like, you, you kind of, you kind of like put the blinders on, right? You, you just ignored obvious things like, well, if this person is on their phone and then they're on their laptop, how are we tracking them the same way? Because it's just cookies on a device. Um, so if, yeah, I think people are starting to realize that, uh, even in, an, even in the best of times, it was always, um, you know, uh, not as good as it was promised to be. <laughs> yeah. It's very alluring, but very difficult to actually do. And so yeah. I think that's what, you know, I'm excited about is I've been a proponent of this methodology that we're going to talk about today for, for a while, even prior to iOS 14. I think iOS 14.5 in particular was sort of the wake-up call to, to that generation or that cohort of d c centric data-centric marketers um, that they can't really rely on those views anymore. Definitely, definitely. Uh, so one question that and I've asked this of a previous guest too, and it's a question that I keep asking myself is, you know, we've been talking about like the triangulation and like looking at multiple signals and kind of saying, well, this says one thing and this says something else and I can kind of corroborate or I can... Maybe it gives me if 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 MTA disagrees with my marketing mix modeling, maybe that's an opportunity for testing to kind of try to find the actual answer. And I have I've really been trying to think about is does MTA even even belong um, within this triangulation space? Does it even should we even continue to look at it as even one source of many um, for performance measurement, or should we you know? Should we now, or do you think there will ever be a time where we should just completely get rid of it? Yeah, I think it's, I think more information is almost always better. And I think there's a couple of different points in there because there's the, there's the optimization argument and there's the, the measurement argument. And those two things kind of go together, right? But as we go into an increasingly algorithmic optimized universe, right, especially on the walled gardens, the major social platforms, and um, even Google is moving to this methodology, right, where it's sort of a self-contained closed loop ecosystem. I do think it's important for us to have good signal pass back to those algorithms to allow for them to be educated correctly on what matters to the business. So having server to server integrations and having good tracking there is important. I've yet to find, and I don't think it exists, but I'd love to learn if there, if there is, call me if you exist out there, um, of a view-based or impression-based uh, MTA. And so what happens is we know for just in aggregate, uh, only about 2% of digital ads get clicked on. The other 98% of ads in the world never get a click. Now, you might argue, well, maybe half of those aren't viewable or aren't, you know, impactful, but that still leaves another, you know, 45 to 55% that are right. And so they produce the vast majority of the value subconsciously or consciously in the user's mind. And right now it's almost impossible to know outside of testing. Jim was exposed on TikTok. Jim was exposed on Meta. Jim was exposed on YouTube and was it the combination of those things that led him to convert? Was it one, two of the three, you know, which was which? And so an MTA, I think, from the signal perspective is important and having those integrations back for platform-based attribution is important, but using them as a way to judge overall budgets or multimedia performance, I think it's, it's a narrow component of what a smart marketer should do. I think it's still helpful but it's not, I wouldn't rank it first in my order of, of priorities. Right. Yeah. That's a good call out, right? Like within platform, it's still going to be used for uh, bid optimizations or budget optimizations and things like that. And the, the other thing that I think about is in terms of, 
you know, the, the channel specialist who's in there every day, they're in, you know, Google ads or they're in, uh, meta or Facebook, you know, tweaking the, the headlines or the creative or whatever it might be, or changing the, the account groups, whatever. Um, you know, they're, they're in their day to day trying to make decisions about what they need to do. And as good as marketing mix modeling is, it's not going to give you that sort of day to day, like, here's what we can do today, or here's how this thing performed yesterday or two days ago or three days ago. So it's, you know, that, that sort of granularity, you know, at the keyword level or at the ad group level or the campaign level, and also kind of the frequency. Like if I need to make, I need to, I just launched this campaign five days ago and I need to make a decision on how it's doing. And maybe I, maybe I kill it or maybe I give it more budget. Like it's still useful for whether it's useful or not, I don't know, but it's still the only tool that I know of um, to really kind of do that sort of day-to-day optimizations and work. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I think it's a matter of, of um, granularity or resolution, right? That kind of the information density that's available in those things. If you have to make a decision, and I understand there's a lot of brands out there where they're on a shoestring budget and they can't do these big elaborate tests, right? I get it. They have $500 or $5,000 to test something. And it's like, they have to make a decision that could impact their business. I think use the signals that you have at, that align kind of with your contextual institutional knowledge to make that call. However, if you're in the seven figure to 10 figure space and revenue per year, I think there's an unhealthy obsession with high resolution measurement and optimization. <laughs> it's kind of like say, you know, uh, which grain of rice in my rice bowl tasted the best. Like, it doesn't matter, right? It's just that, you know, it's an overall ingredient to a much larger recipe. And so I try to guide brands to look at more of big swings, big concepts, you know, like product category or entire channel category and things like that. Those are the things that are going to make a large change. That being said, unlocking some sort of, great campaign or great creative headline or something like that is a, is a worthwhile endeavor and those higher resolution tools are definitely helpful to do that. Yeah. That, that's, that's great to like, you talk about like finding that great creative or that new campaign that's going to perform well. And, and it just reminded me of, um, you, you know, that unhealthy obsession of, of, uh, granularity and like, you know, again, I, I count myself in this bucket of people who have focused too much on, trying to get multi-touch attribution to work by, you know, hook or by crook, um, trying to come up with all kinds of workarounds to make it work and, and everything. And it's like, okay, well that, that effort could have been spent a lot more, um, fruitfully elsewhere, right? Like you think about, um, some of the studies out there that show, uh, the impact that creative has on an ads influence versus, you know, the, you know, how many times someone saw the ad or whether you did this attribution or that attribution or whatever, like we could just spend more time and effort on coming up with really good creative. And that's going to have much more of an impact, um, over what we're doing. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of different thoughts in there, but, uh, yeah, no, it's a fair point. I, and I think, look, I don't, I don't think it's not worthwhile to have that as an option. I just think it's important to have a priority grid and some of it is somewhat or priority system some of it is a a matter of speed to your point of like okay today what am i going to do today i have to make a decision today right and i i am a fan of looking at platform tools or other forms of technology that do have those really granular levers to pull or to read to make those daily decisions and then i think using something like a media mix model that can apply a larger coefficient on those things or some sort of uh, adjustment on those things to provide additional macro context at something more like a monthly level, I think is smart. And then you always want to align to some kind of overarching business goal. Is it revenue? Is it profit? Is it CAC? You know, what's the kind of KPI that you're marching, the, the one key thing that you're marching towards that all of your marketing should be doing? And so it's a matter of like time scale and potentially depending on your organization, hierarchy within that organization, you know, the CFO is going to think about something very differently than the CMO and the CMO is going to think about something different than their VP of growth. And that person's different than their media buyer, you know, like, so there's a different kind of matchup depending on your area of focus. 
Yeah, definitely. And that kind of leads into to the next uh, topic pretty nicely, which is thinking about those different levels of of business measurement, right? And and trying to prioritize what we what we look at and and what kind of gets um, weighted more or or sort of believed more. Um, and I know you've come up with uh, a great framework around this called the Beats model. So maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I love this. And um, I think it's, it, they go hand in hand, right? Because when we talk about triangulating, like my platform says the ROAS on this ad or this channel is killing it. And then my, but my business finances are not going well. There's a discordance there, right? And so it's like, well, which takes precedent? And so having a simple, and I like acronyms that are um, easy to remember, but having a simple sort of order of operations, I think, gets everybody aligned. And so this is a tool that we use or, or kind of a mantra that we use at, at Power, um, but it's BEATS, B-E-A-T-S, and it stands for business is number one. You have to align to the business goals, the business financials. Your your one true view is your P&L. If your goal is to hit a certain EBITDA or a certain revenue, a certain contribution margin or a certain customer count, whatever, if Facebook says your revenue is going up, but my net suite says my revenue is going down, something ain't right there, right? So you need to have a priority of number one is the business goals. That's what, that's what matters. Number two, E is experiments. And I think experiments allow you and taking a, and I use that term experiment and not testing very intentionally because tests have kind of lost some of the power of that word and that people are like, oh yeah, let's just test it. And it just translates into lots of sort of scrappy ad hoc many tests at once that don't have good results, but an experiment connotes science and planning and a certain kind of structure around it. And that's important is, you know, we're going to experiment into this new audience. We're going to experiment into this new product line and having that calibrate all of your marketing through incrementality testing, through geo testing, random control trial testing, things like that allows you to really validate that what you're doing is making an impact on that primary principle, that business level KPI. But those are slow. They, by design, they're labor intensive. They can at times be business disruptive. And I understand that. And so a less, but still viable, a less effective, but still viable option, in my opinion, are is A for analyses. And when I say analyses, I'm bucketing the entire giant school of, of data science, right? In that one letter, which is a silly thing. People are scoffing right now, but media mix modeling, causal impact analysis, regression modeling, whatever, you're, you, you know, pick your poison there, but some form of data-driven decisioning that can allow you to not have to disrupt the business. And there's certain uh, experiments that cannot be done. Like if I, if I say, hey, I want to do a random control trial on influencer marketing, it's almost exactly. impossible to do because there's no way for me to control who watches an influencer video or not, right? So yeah, I that's... have to use modeling in some way. And and that model, that analysis can be used, like we were talking about earlier, to put a coefficient or a cofactor on your kind of day-to-day operations and update it much more frequently, especially with some of the more agile MMMs out there. I'm actually very proud that Power is, is in this class now where we have one, but uh, Michael Kaminsky of Recast has one and... Um, Michael True of Prescient has one, you know, there's a bunch of them out there where they're they're moving into this space of more frequently updated models, Agile MMM. And then T is for technology. And that gets at the crux of your question around MTA. I still think it's viable. That's platform data. That's GA data. If you're on like an ad server and you're doing like large programmatic buys or ABM buys or B2B buys, using like a, you know, campaign manager or Nielsen or leads RX or whatever, all those tools I think can be helpful so long as they can be calibrated from those earlier higher in the hierarchy elements, right? Experiments, analyses, if they're sort of a black box, I don't recommend them. And that's actually one of the cons to Google analytics in my opinion is it's pretty I mean, it's free, so you get what you pay for, but it's pretty stuck in that you can't really adjust it that much, right? You have to transform that information in another box somewhere to get to get at the heart of it. And then last, but but honestly, not least, I, I put it at the end of the um, 
at the end of the acronym uh, because I think it's one of those ones that's like a lot of brands are take it or leave it, but I do recommend it, which is surveys, S for surveys. And I think that's brand lift studies, focus groups, post-purchase surveys, pre-purchase surveys, you know, wire quizzes, any kind of interaction that you can have with a customer Mm -hmm. where you're able to say, how did you hear about us? Why did you buy from us? What prevented you from buying earlier? Those aren't great questions. Don't use those, by the way. (laughs) Um, John Ivanaka is going to yell at me for using those questions. But there's, there's people out there that specialize in that kind of survey methodology, right? No commerce mm-hmm. is, a, is a tool that we use on a lot of our clients of power for post-purchase surveys. And that's super powerful to say like, hey, you know what? We're TikTok is 1% of our media budget, but it's 11% of what people say they found us on. Something to look at. You know, like, I wouldn't use that to supersede business p I wouldn't use that to supersede my media mix model, but it's interesting. Like, let's take a look at that. So that's sort of the order of operations. And if something lower on the list contradicts something higher on the list, you can discard it and kind of go back to the the top of the hierarchy. Yeah. I, I love that framework because yeah, it does tell you like, listen, if, if the business numbers are going down, but Facebook says we're crushing it, uh, Facebook's probably not right. <laughs> um, and on the surveys topic, uh, or point, um, that's something that I've recently come around on. Um, and again, this is probably just based on my own, um, uh, over-reliance in the past on this, this conception of being able to track everything and like this misconception of, oh, I know truth because I'm tracking all of the data, but, and, you know, we would think of surveys and be like, oh, well, we're asking people how they found out about us. They're not going to remember. Or they're going to say the wrong thing. It's not going to be true, you know, quote unquote. And it's like, well, that's kind of not necessarily the point. And, um, you know, the thing that I always think about is like, if someone clicked on your, um, was, yeah, if someone clicked on your, your paid search ad and then they saw your TikTok ad and then they clicked on, you know, they signed up for email and they clicked on your email and they came and purchased and you ask them, how did you find out about us? And they say TikTok, even though that's not how they originally found out about you, that's the one that stuck in their mind. So it's, it should bear some weight. <laughs> so yeah, yeah definitely. It's, it's not about like I, getting the truth of like, what was the first channel you interacted with us on? It's more about, yeah, what was, what do you remember about us? Yeah. And it was interesting is if you have multiple, uh, data points that corroborate that, like, let's just, let's continue off that TikTok example. Um, let's say that your, your attribution system, I'll just keep picking on Google, Google analytics. They're not going to listen to this and, or, or care too much, but I'll just keep picking on GA. Right. So Google analytics says that TikTok has basically no conversions at all, right? A, a ROAS of effectively zero. And mm-hmm. so if you were using that as your source of truth, well, then you're probably going to move away from TikTok because you view that as a loss of, of investment. That's a wasted media spend. But if your surveys are saying 10% of your people are saying, hey, I, I learned about you through TikTok, then that's something to look at. And then if you run a media mix model and your media mix model says, 8% of all of your new customers are contributed from TikTok. That doesn't exactly match 10, but directionally, that's a heck of a lot better than zero, which is what GA says. And it just so happens, well, let's do an experiment where we turn TikTok off in half the country and track our total revenue in that half versus the half that has it on. And what do you know? The half with it off drops. in total revenue, which again is a different number than 8% or 10%. But now we have a story here that there's a sort of a synergistic effect that's happening and it's a flow of decision making that allows us to to do that. Now, all that's slow, right? But the surveys, a lot of times, talking to your customer is very important and getting that first party data. And this would technically, I would say, is more like zero party data because it's voluntary rather than collected, right? The people are actually giving it to you is extremely valuable. And with AI tools now, and some of these AI tools are getting brought into these survey repositories, you can very quickly find trends. And so like one of the things that we do, it's not even really about measurement so much, but at Power is we will we will use AI to review all of your surveys and all of your reviews of your product over a last certain period and pull out the five or 10 most common words or adjectives used, good or bad. And then we start to feel like, oh, like we just did this one yesterday where it's a, uh, it's a jewelry brand. And a lot of people talked about 
the comfort of it. It's very comfortable, which maybe you wouldn't necessarily think of as a selling point for jewelry, which is more of an aesthetic, right? But okay, that's interesting that a lot of people have a positive sentiment around comfort in the survey. How does that inform creative strategy? How does that inform the value props on the website? And so it's beyond the surveys go beyond just measurement and attribution and definitely help in a lot of different ways that I think is valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and as you were talking about, like the, you know, the survey says 10% and the, uh, the MMM says 8% and the, the, you run an experiment and it says 6%, like all of these things are saying different numbers. And it just, it made me kind of reminded me of the, the, one of the mantras that I've been thinking about over the past couple of years, which is we're not trying to, we're not trying to get to, you know, like capital T truth. We're just trying to reduce uncertainty, right? So we can never expect our numbers to all line up to the exact same number. And now we know exactly what that number is. It's, it's more about like all these numbers are going to be different, but it's, it's how, how much are we reducing our uncertainty about something, right? We're never, we're never going to get hundred percent of the way there, but you know, at what level are we okay with uncertainty to say, okay, we're, we're pretty sure this is kind of the general area of what the, you know, the ROI of Facebook is, and, and we're going to go with that. And I think that's sort of a, a different way of thinking for, for me it is. And I think for a lot of marketers, which is again, back to this whole like past decade of MTA, where we were thinking that, that, that was like real. And now instead of thinking of, of getting this actual number, we're thinking about uh, reducing uncertainty. And I think that's a harder way of thinking just generally. I think a lot of people have problems with, you know, thinking probabilistically instead of deterministically, but it's something that, you know, the smart markers out there are going to really start to embrace and uh, hopefully thrive, uh, I think, as we as we move forward with this kind of uh, measurement. Yeah, well put. I, I mean, I think it's going to be thrust upon everybody, whether they want it or not. I, you know, we're at the early days of data deprecation. I, you know, there's there's a world not too far in the future, in my opinion, where any form of individualized, even cohort level tracking related to PII will be heavily, heavily regulated either through law or technology. And, you know, I think honestly, that's a good thing. I think that it's been, there's been this sort of tyranny of data for the last decade plus with social media, especially that is probably not great for the larger society right but it's like we kind of put a blind eye to that we're like well we gotta we gotta improve our roi we gotta do what we gotta do for our clients right and i I appreciate that business is about making money but i think there are ways to satisfy both and i think there is a kind of an ongoing evolution towards this uh, value exchange with brands and consumers that allows the brand to improve their ROI and the consumer gets a better product or a better experience out of it. And I think the the marketers that are going to lean into that well, there is a certain degree of uncertainty inherent in that because we're talking about big, broad chunks of stuff rather than really, really narrow cuts of stuff. Yeah, exactly. And and I, I 100% agree with you. I think, uh, I think what's coming uh, and what has been coming for the past couple of years with, with um restrictions around what data we can collect and how we can use it and what Apple kind of what restrictions they put in place to the data that we can get. Uh, it, it always hurts, right? When, when something is taken away from you, it always hurts, but I think ultimately it's going to make us be more creative. It's going to lead to more creativity, which is, you know, which is a good thing, right? We've been had this over-reliance on, on data to help us make our decisions or to make our decisions for us. And now we have to kind of take a step back and say, huh, what, what could work here? What, you know, go back to first principles. What do we think? How do we think this marketing uh, influences our, our customers' decisions? And what kind of creative message could we put in front of them that would resonate with them? It's, it goes back to, you know, more creativity, more thoughtfulness <laughs> put into the campaigns, uh, which certainly can be a good thing, I think. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, look, a lot of the whole point of measurement is to make a decision to improve performance, right? And I think if I asked somebody, would you rather make a large change to performance or a small change to performance? I think everybody would say, well, I'd rather make a large change to performance. And so the resolution of that 
measurement should match with your expectation. And I'll give you an example. If you're a smaller brand, and when I say smaller, I don't mean this in a disparaging way, but a brand that's maybe less than $10 million of revenue a year, and you're a single channel of revenue. So you're only sold on Amazon, or you're only sold on D2C, or you're only sold in store, right? The chances that your media is not incremental are very low. Your media, especially in paid, right? You're, it's very likely that if you're investing in Meta or you're investing in Google, maybe you're doing it wrong. And so there is some like, <laughs> there is some <laughs> technical execution. I don't want to get yelled at for that, but there is definitely a right way to do it. But assuming you're doing kind of best practices, it's very likely that your media is helping you. To what degree, that's maybe requires a bit of experimentation, but right. follow your margins, stick with your P&L, tolerate a bit of waste, and you'll probably grow your way out of the hole if your product is good, right? If your product is bad, then that's a whole nother problem, right? Marketing is not going to save you. Where it gets tricky and where brands, I think, should start to really look at measurement and need more rigor around it and need to use models like the Beats model and need to use multiple variant test structures and triangulation, all these things that we're talking about. It's usually more like around the 20 to 50 million a year ballpark. And that's usually where we see brands start to hit a point where they need multiple revenue streams and they need uh, multiple product, even collections or, or, or persona categories, right? And the chances that some of that media is waste goes up. Yeah. And so, and the margins also for those businesses tend to get thinner because they're operating a larger organization, right? Their net incomes tend to go down unless you're like in SaaS or something. Um, but that's, so if you're, if you're listening to this and you're in the like, you know, five to $10 million space, you're probably overthinking it. Uh, just stick with your margins, look at your P&L and you'll probably be fine. But if you're in that 50 million plus range, then definitely, if you don't know words like incrementality by now, you're probably behind the game because a lot of your competitors, hundreds of them that I work with are very, very deep in the weeds there. And that's where the measurement becomes important. And I'll give you an example. I posted about this on LinkedIn recently, but we had a client. They're doing about just shy of $100 million of revenue a year in store brick as well as online and they had always spent historically at about 15 percent of revenue so 15 percent cost of sale in in media and they needed to cut back as they get bigger they're more margin conscious which is a very common thing that happens right and so we did some tests for them and we found that they were significantly over invested in a couple of channels a couple of places and so we reduced their spend. This was about, you know, we started this process almost a year ago now. Um, but we reduced their spend by over 40% and it had no loss of revenue. So yeah. that tells you that, you know, the revenue's flat year over year. EBITDA is a lot better, but 40% less spend. And we're talking on the order of millions of dollars a year because uh, almost right, uh, like 15 million almost, right? Yeah, right. And so I think they saved like 6 million this year. And so the overall impact was huge from a margin perspective and we probably could have got there by just cranking spend down from the beginning like we got there in a very scientific and smart way and big props to the team if they're listening to this you guys did an awesome job but like we probably could have got there three times faster if we just said hey you know what we're just gonna just cut all your spend in half for a month and see what happens and you know so Take some big swings, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. My is the point of my story here is like if we, you you can get to a, an answer quickly if you're willing to risk making bigger changes. Yeah, and and it takes a special kind of um, company to be okay with doing that. I think I, I'm optimistic that I think we're seeing more and more of that. I think that's what it's going to take. But you know, I, I've heard the stories of and I've, I've dealt with clients that were very cautious about reducing spend. Because they were afraid they were going to, you know, the lost sales that would happen if we if we cut back in our our branded paid search, we might lose sales. And like, okay, keep spending then. <laughs> like you can only like you could lead the horse to water, but yeah, you know, can't make. Them well, the drink. way to prove that out is you know it's a dim. And I love talking with CFOs. CFOs are my favorite because yeah. <clears throat> they're very objective. They get the P and L. That's their thing that they care about. So if I can show to a CFO 
hey, here's the dollars and cents of an opportunity cost that you have. They're usually one of the biggest proponents. Usually in, in marketing agencies, CFOs hate your guts because you're seen as a huge cost center, right? But if we can actually save them money, then they love you. So what I do with that example, they're nervous about uh, reducing spend. Like may, let's say we run a model and we say, hey, you're way overspent. Your ROI is not profitable on your marketing. We recommend you spend X. They're like, we don't want to do that. Okay. The way to do that is to then downsize the risk by concentrating the group or the cohort of customers that you expose to that risk. So rather than across the whole country or across the whole globe, cutting your media in half, just pick a little area. And there's science around this, right? But pick a, a, a one to five key markets that you run in and cut the budget there and see, you know, there's 212 DMAs in the US, pick five yeah. of them, right? And see what total revenue impact is in those five DMAs versus a trend. And this is this is a simplified form of incrementality testing. What we do at Power is a, a lot more complicated, but in a nutshell, that's what it is. And so I show the CFOs that, I say, well, hey, here you're doing, in these five DMAs, you're doing $100,000 of revenue a month. Even if marketing was contributing 100% of that revenue, which we know it's not, right? We know you have natural brand equity and organic baseline revenue, right? But let's just pretend the worst that would happen is you'd lose $100,000 of revenue that month out of your $10 million a year. Right. And you're saving 50 grand on marketing. So your net loss is really only 50 grand <laughs> to find out if you're wasting 5 million a year across the country. Would you want to sacrifice 50 grand to find out if you're wasting $5 million? And they're like, okay, yeah, it sounds insane when you put it that way. So you just have to frame it up exactly. in the right way and then you can run the test. Exactly. Yeah. I love, I love that example. And I, I saw that when you posted it on LinkedIn the other day and I, I loved it. They had a lot of, a lot of good comments on there too. And, um, <clears throat> This is kind of a good point maybe to wrap up on. Uh, I was going to point people to your LinkedIn profile. You've been posting some really great content um, for a long time, as long as I've been following you. Uh, so definitely, everyone, go follow Ben on LinkedIn. Uh, as they say, uh, links in the show notes. Uh, but Ben, where else, uh, if people have questions, if they want to talk to you or Power Digital, how should they reach out to you? Yeah, good question. Um, and thank you for that. It means a lot. I. A lot of the folks, a lot of the good work that I post about is done by the team at Power. So uh, all all kudos and praise should go to them. I'm just I just package it up and talk about it. <laughs> that being said, uh, I have probably the best SEO of any non famous person in the world. I think I'm the only Ben Dutter uh, in the world. I have all the URLs and email addresses and everything. So if you just Google me, uh, you can find me anywhere. And LinkedIn is probably where I'm most active. You can email me at ben at powerdigital.com. Go to powerdigital.com and check us out. Um, but yeah, happy to to chat. My calendar is public if you want to book time with me. I have Ooh. an open door policy with anybody. I know I'm asking for trouble there, but uh, <laughs> feel free to to pop 30 minutes on my calendar and we can chit chat. Fantastic. All right. Open, open invitation to the calendar. That's amazing. And uh, for everyone uh, of the audience who uh, stuck around to the end, they got that nice... Uh, a uh, nice prize at the end uh, to book a book a link on your calendar. Um, and uh, thanks for everyone to stay into the end of this podcast. And we will talk to you next time.